Okay, so welcome to the NorCal EMS Medical Advisory Run Review for July 7, 2015. I think we have got some uh, good illustrative cases. So, case one. 62-year-old um, gentleman uh, with chest pain who is dispatched code 3 for chest pain and an urgent care. Uh, evidently, he had a motorcycle accident earlier in the day and went to this urgent care. He was found by EMS sitting in the clinic lobby with complaints of chest pain and minor bleeding from his forehead above his left eye. He was riding an ATV at about 20 miles per hour when he was ejected and then unfortunately for him he was run over by the trailer that was being towed. Kind of puts a damper on your day. Patient states that it happened. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Try that again. <coughs> Patient states that this happened uh, approximately one o'clock. He denies any uh, medical history, denies any drug allergies, and he denies he's taken any medications. So. Uh, Documentation is, is as I find it. I don't modify it, except unless it's really, uh, the grammar is difficult to understand. So his ABCs are intact. His glass coma scale is 15. His skin is pink, warm, and dry. Lung sounds are clear. He denies any loss of consciousness. Negative for headache. He says he hasn't been dizzy. His pupils are round and equal in size and reactive to light. He's got some swelling to his forehead above his left eye with a laceration that has minor bleeding control with an application of a 4x4. Seems pretty straightforward. Anybody have any questions, comments, concerns so far? Uh, he has pain on palpation to his neck. No bleeding, no deformity, no bruising. Negative back pain upon palpation. So, once our new uh, for uh, policy protocol is written, he would qualify for spinal motion restriction. Potentially just having a collar on and sitting up even. So he had no deformity, no bruising, but he does have the pain. So, no obvious sign of trauma noted to the back or spine. Chest on palpation, his chest is stable with equal rise and fall. Good documentation there. No obvious signs of trauma to the anterior chest. Large abrasion to the right flank with no current bleeding. Probably where the trailer ran him over. His abdominal exam is unremarkable. I nearly fell out of my chair. They actually took a temperature. That never happens. Uh, no obvious signs of trauma noted to the rest of the abdomen. Pelvis is stable. Again, we don't, when you're doing pelvic exam, you don't rock them anymore. You squeeze, uh, do compression, see if there's any tenderness. The thought process being that when you rock them, if they have a pelvic fracture, then you can open it up more and cause more bleeding. I've never seen it documented this way, but femurs are stable meaning he has no leg pain. Laceration with soft tissue protruding from his right inner biceps with minor bleeding control with an application of 4x4 and a curl X wrap. Again, so far pretty unremarkable. CSM times 4. Uh, no obvious signs of trauma to right lower arm or left lower arm or to lower extremities. Pretty clear, straightforward. While on scene, the patient is placed in full spinal immobilization. With rigid collar, patient placed on a rigid backboard, head immobilized with blocks, and patient secured to the backboard. So let's hope that uh, in the future I won't see this anymore. And that happened at 1,300 hours and didn't say what time this was? Uh, very difficult because the times aren't well. In about an hour later. So... He doesn't need the rigid backboard. He's transported code three to the hospital. Why? 
I don't know. Just because it's a, I, there are, I've heard from some of my students who work around trauma centers that if they call a trauma activation, patients have to be transported code three. I think that's ridiculous. This patient didn't need code three transport. He uh, was, everything's he was, showing. He, he was, was stable. He was stable. Pink, warm, and dry. He's not in shock. So. No, I didn't, you know, again, you're right. Um, he didn't need to be transported code three. Uh, in route, place an oxygen, uh, raise pulse ox from 94 to 100%. I would even venture to say he probably didn't need oxygen. His stats were fine. Um, giving him two liters, I think, was fine. Didn't hurt him. Most of the hyperoxemic issues come from stroke patients anyway. Cardiac monitor shows sinus rhythm, 20 gauge IV, unsuccessful left arm, since vein blue. Uh, they checked the blood glucose, not really sure why, other than they had the blood and they were able to do it. Um, That's why. Every time. And you can charge for it. Not and cool. 18 gauge, unsuccessful, patient update given to the hospital, advised not to continue to try the IV. At least they had the good sense to say. Absolutely. Enough. So if they didn't need an IV, they really don't need code 3. Uh, correct. There you are being a stickler, Mr. Lane. I'm just, I, I'm tired of the code 3 stuff. I hear it all the time. Well, it's he, cool and bitching, but it's not necessary. Well, it's dangerous for the provider, the patient, and the wake effect as you're zipping through the light, all the other accidents that you're causing. Um, if I could, I'd remove light bars from ambulances in the siren. I mean, there are very few times I think that you really need code three. And we as the base hospital should not be dictating to the provider whether to code three return or not. That's up to them. Does the patient need that extra few minutes that you might save? I was bringing in a stroke stroke patient to or STEMI, I can't remember which one. It was to Mercy. Drove all the way from Weaverville or Lewiston or whatever and called the hospital just before I got on the point of venture and they said, Oh well you probably should come code three since it's a it's a you're doing this code, so okay. It didn't change the time frame at all. Didn't hurry anything. Couldn't go any faster anyways. And all you need to do is have your patient in the back going, oh God, I'm dying, they're going code three. I, I think that's, that's really up to the, the physician's perception that you, know, you can go faster in code three. I mean, yes, it, maybe they're, they're used to being in you know, downtown LA, and code three I can get through a bit quicker in rush hour traffic than I can. That here, you know, from Weaverville to Reading, you know, if you can really go any faster. And they, they, they don't realize that. Actually, I did a ride along with LA City Fire Ambulance, and they, their policy as soon as they get on the uh, on the freeway, they turn off their lights and right. sirens. That was our, when Phoenix, we did the same thing. They're, you're going to do cause more accidents if you do good. And, you don't, and you're not going to go that much faster. Anyways. So, anyway, that's a different story. We've talked about that. Okay. Uh, patient arrived to their destination staying decreased in chest pain. Uh, now only complain to the pain to their head. Uh, report to the trauma physician given and patient care transferred. So, 1333, they document their exam. Normal status for patient oriented person. Place and events. Neurologic, normal. Eyes reactive bilaterally, very nice. Skin, normal. You know, it should be pink, warm, and dry. Normal, oh, come on. Head and face, swelling, edema, pain, tenderness, laceration, swelling to the forehead above left eye with laceration with minor bleeding. That's a good description. Uh, neck, pain and tenderness, no JVD, trachea midline, tenderness and palpation to back of neck. It would be nice if it was the entire neck, uh, midline, not midline. 
uh, chest and lung exam, well, I don't like normal, but clear and equal breath sounds, good. Tenderness to left, tenderness to right, pain non-radiating, clear breath sounds left, clear breath sounds right, upper chest tenderness on palpation, non-radiation, negative bruising, negative deformity. Good. Heart normal. As opposed to the one that's on the left there. Oh, the right side, yeah. The right side instead of on the left side. Mm -hmm. um, left upper quadrant, left lower quadrant, unremarkable. Same thing for the right upper and lower quadrant. Now, I take a little offense here. They said GU normal. They didn't look. Come on. That's just a, a, a drop down that they didn't unclick. Ugh. Cervical normal. Well, no, it's not. They, so they had neck pain. pain. It's not normal, but that's pain. Right. <clears throat> you gotta be careful with these uh, electronic drop downs. Thoracic normal, lumbar normal. Right upper extremity pain, tenderness, positive uh, capillary refill sensation, motor function. Laceration to the right inner biceps area with minor bleeding and tissue protruding. They document that bad, better. Cervical should have had something mentioned. They contradict themselves. You're right. Left upper normal, left uh, lower right normal, lower left normal. Now, the BPs are interesting. He's pretty hypertensive. I think that's probably not new. Heart rate's fine. Respiratory rate's fine. Uh, SpO2 is fine, GCS normal, pain 3, I'm assuming that's on a 10 scale. Um, their blood pressure, however, at 15, 1402, I just have issues with. Well, if you're moving, what are you hoping to do? And I would be Malfunction. Hmm? Malfunction, they should have rechecked it. Exactly. Push the button again. Um, 1333, they did the spinal immobilization. 1334, bleeding hemorrhage control. When I looked at the chart closely, they made five IV attempts on this poor person. They made him look like a freaking pincushion. They should be ashamed. It was an intern. Actually, you're right, it was a student attached to this call. If he had a document so many IVs anyway, so. No, yeah. they needed an IV attempt to call this an ALS procedure, so. And for the trauma activation, they want that. I mean, excuse me. Go on, Jackie. Bleeding hemorrhage control, what, where, when? <laughs> Is it from everything? It sounded like all the bleeding was controlled already. Well, yeah, I'm assuming, and you, you know, you know what happens when you assume that this was to the right inner with a two by bicep, two, with a four, four by four, four and the curve and also oh, okay. the above the left eye, and above the left eye. So documentation, lots of good points, lots of good points, a few points that I don't like, uh, the contradictions. Quality of care, I think that was fine. Uh, no. Why? Why? Well, yeah, okay. Yeah, okay, that, that's my issue. The guy had been walking around for an hour or whatever. He, he drove himself into the... Urgent care. Company. Urgent care. Congratulations. He got run over by an ATV. He walked to his car. He got into his car. He drove all the way to the urgent care. Got into the urgent care. Sat there for what, however long in a chair waiting for the doctor to finally find out examine him, got an examination, they said, oh darn, you probably should go get some checkout that we can't do here. And the ambulance shows up and throws the guy in a full C-spine and he, and then pincushioned him for mm -hmm. no real medical need other than they wanted to make it, a, and why did they make it a trauma triage, trauma activation? Because he was ejected from the vehicle? I think the ejection and he was ran over by the trailer. I'd be more worried about him being run over by the trailer. Is this a small trailer, a big trailer, right. a loaded trailer? All it says is trailer. You know, did it have a thousand pounds in it and so he was squished? 
Don't and know. Some of those AT, some of those trailers that they hook to ATVs weigh more, no more than about twenty pounds. Right. Little itty bitty tires and you know hold three pieces of wood. Yeah, it would have been nice to know small, medium, or large trailer loaded or not. Um, I the quality of the care. Well, they shouldn't have poked that guy five times. I agree, but on the other side, you get that where the paramedics get to the trauma room and the, and the trauma doc just rips into the medic because it is their IV. And uh, for what reason, though? I would say to the doc, why did he need an IV? You know, why, you know, why did you want me to try multiple times? If, so you, you get that either end. You know? If he did yeah. need an IV, if he did need an IV, after two unsuccessful or three unsuccessful with a student, then the paramedic should have gotten one. That's my, that's how I would look at it too, is, okay, you've had your chance, no more pin cushions, let's get it. I mean, it doesn't say whether all five were done by the student or not. No, it does not. The uh, guy could have had just a, one of those shitty veins and it was better to poke him five times with a catheter than to have him show up in the ED with an I.O. sticking out of his... I was going to say, well, that could, they could have started an I.O., that would have been... Hey, but it's a trauma alert, code 3, so, yeah, it was warranted an I.O. Okay. Any other issues, comments, or concerns about this? Protocol change, yes. He's fine. Overall care? Other than being poked a whole bunch of times. I mean, it's appropriate. I think it's appropriate. I think it was and, appropriate. And, and, you know, why I was asked why they needed to go code 3. I mean, you know... That's the question is, is in that area, you know, like Dan says, okay, you call a trauma, you have to go code three. You know, uh, you call a trauma, you have to get a line no matter what, you know, or you're going to be looked at by you know, so is it okay, and does it make sense to deviate from the standard protocol? Right. Um, protocol changes well, we're implementing the C-spine. Um, the other thing, too, is I'm not well. I could send out a letter, a memo, saying that not all patients need code three return. And that really needs to be up to the medic. Um, that probably will be round filed. So the teaching take home points: don't turn your patients into pin cushions. Okay. So this is an interesting one. Cardiac arrest, dispatch for nausea and vomiting. They uh, arrive to find the patient sitting on the toilet with his wife holding him up. It's never a good sign. Po patients found pulse, uh, that should be pulseless in apneic. Oops. Not so, good not good for the patient. LSU uh, crew carried the patient out to the front room and started CPR. Patient reported that the patient had been vomiting a black color fluid for the past 24 hours. Didn't want to go to the hospital. Yeah, and over the last 24 hours got weaker and weaker. This is just not a good thing. Gets better. So, she reports that she kept trying to get him to go to the hospital, but he would not. Today, he became so weak he couldn't stand on his own. About a year ago, he's lost weight, unknown reason. In December 2014, he went to the hospital and was diagnosed with an unknown mass on his pancreas. Really bad. Patient signed out AMA before any further treat assessment or treatment. Uh, since December, he has been in and out of the hospital multiple times for nausea, vomiting, weakness, and weight loss. When do we have a, a time frame from December 14 to when? This was April of this year. So six months, approximately five, six months. Right. He didn't do too bad for that. Uh, no, he didn't, to be honest. <clears throat> um, the mass was biopsy with no results. Always the case. He was scheduled to see a physician the next day at UC Davis for a further assessment of the mass. Patient's wife reported did not know if patient had a DNR in place. 
She tried multiple conversations on multiple times with the patient about his medical condition. He would not talk uh, to her about it. He was in denial. Patient's wife reported she had a feeling that the patient was going to eventually die from his medical condition because it was very hard for her to get him to see care. She's correct. She's correct. Darwin wins. Darwin wins. Patient reported just before she called 911. Uh, she was trying to get him off the toilet. He was too weak to do it, and she was unable to get him up. So she, I'm not sure why she had her sister call 911, but her sister called 911. Uh, patient became unresponsive during that call, tried to shake him to wake up while he wasn't asleep. He was unconscious, and he would not wake up. That's uh, not surprising. And then she noticed him not breathing. Um, they found him closed, sitting on the toilet with the lid closed. Patient was moved to the floor. Patient, again, I spelled it wrong. Hmm? Sloppy, pulseless, and apneic. Pale. Extremities were cold. The core was still warm. Patient was extremely emaciated with severe muscle atrophy. Pupils were fixed and dilated. Uh, the skin of the patient's fingers were black. He was really poor perfusion. Uh, ALS treatment was initiated on the patient. I understand what they did, and they were in a no-win situation, but this was not going to end well, no matter what. Yeah. That the, depending upon where they got the information from the wife about she knew that her husband was going to die, to me, on scene, would have given me the thing of what, how much I wanted to continue on with this. I would, unfortunately, his body was still warm. Right. You, you have to do, you have to do your 20 minutes of ALS, blah, 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 whatever. Pulseless aptic, put a monitor on, find a May Sisley, um, call the base hospital and say this is what's going on and the wife thinks, knows that he was going to die. I bet you most docs would, a lot of them would just say thank you with the time is. Um, True, unless the wife says I want to. Well, of course. As the wife says that, so there's some delay, there's only two personnel at the scene. Uh, paramedic performed CPR. Uh, while CPR was performed, patient was having a copious amounts of black fluid fill the mouth. Patient was suctioned multiple times during CPR to keep the airway patent. Unsuccessful IV attempts. Um, they established an IO. They couldn't get it to flow. They should have put it on a pressure bag. Um, after the second epi, he went back into AFib, and then he went to a systole. They called the hospital, the physician concurred with treatment, and gave orders to stop. He was pronounced at 1432. The patient's wife was notified, and she said she was glad that he wasn't suffering anymore. I would have done that. I would have, personally, I would have gone to the wife sooner. Sooner. How much fluid did he get? Uh, it's not clear how much he got, if any. Um, I mean, that's what he needed. No. Well, if it, yeah, if anything, he needed fluid, but. Instead of the epi, I mean, you're squeezing the dry pump. He was dead. He, he was, was. He was, absolutely. But if you were going to do anything, if you're talking about, okay, what are you going to do to help this guy at all? You have an IO going. You know, right. What is the purpose of the IO? Just to give the epi? No. Give him some fluids. Yeah, I mean, epi will eventually. Given enough doses, we'll get a brick pumping, but um, the exam, head and face normal, can't believe that, neck normal, chest and lungs normal, clear and equal breath sounds. How can he have clear and equal breath sounds? If he's got bringing this nasty stuff up. If, uh, he's, yeah. bre if he's not breathing, he can't have clear and equal up. Well, that you too. Could, you could say with ventilation, Lation. with ventilations, I have good air movement. But he doesn't have clear and equal breath sounds because that's indicating that he's, he's breathing. breathing on his own. Um, heart's normal. Then yeah. they wrote not done. How can a heart be normal if it's pulseless? 
I'm not sure. I'm just curious. Well, that's why I brought this one to forward is because... This, this sounds like one of those drop-downs that if you, if you check something else, the... The default still stays. It what happens so you have to is check normal. Well, this, this is image trend, and you can change it. What happened was someone went ahead and just said normal, normal for all, and then they went in and just and then they added things. a few different things right. instead and of going so through. Normal. So they did their normal. I'm doing this, and then they went in. I know some programs do that, and then you have to remember to uncheck the normal stuff. Um, That's the trouble when they click normal for all or whatever else. The, Instead of going down the list and actually putting in each one. Right. And I will send this to the provider and say, um, they need some education. GU, again, uh, they didn't do that. The yeah, other it can't be because he was throwing up blood. So it can't be. Yeah. yeah. So um, cervical, lumbar, and thoracic, no pain. Well... Dead people, dead people don't no complain, complain of pain. Uh, extremities normal. And his, his extremities aren't normal he because has black fingers. he has black hands. Back of his hands were totally black. Now, unresponsive under mental status, you know that? That's okay. Neuro not done, I can understand that. Uh, eyes fixed, non-reactive, okay. Skin, cool, pale, dry, poor turgor. Again, I can understand that. So here's, here's interesting looking at the thing, 1358 asystole, 1358 CPR, 1359 suctioning the airway, and then venous access extremity, they tried three times, nothing. Finally, they do the intraosseous. Then they give epi. 15 minutes after starting CPR. Right. And... 14, sorry. I don't see, I never saw volume documented. Yeah, there's no volume, and there's not, what about, what did they do for the airway? Did they put an OPA and MPA? No. Don't know. Uh, venous access, epi, they did a blood glucose, that's nice. Uh huh, epi, a defib manual, epi. So, dispatch notified at 1356, 1346, sorry. Dispatched. 1348, in route, 1350, at scene, 1354, a minute later at the patient, and then CPR discontinued at 1432. So this guy was pulseless and apneic from the time they got the 911 call till they arrived at the scene of the patient, so that was already... Nine minutes. And then first CPR... Um, was 58, so... Use 12 minutes without. Yeah. So. With a history of, my guess, just off well, the top of That's pancreatic cancer. Pancreatic cancer. Right. Which and, has. And five months is a pretty good run uh, for severe tumor, big, big mass on the pancreatic. Right. From what I understand. Five, six months. Um, the documentation. Poor at best. I didn't bother showing you lots of strips of asystole. I didn't think that the learning from me scanning them in and showing them to you was any learning there. The quality of care delivered. I, I, I think they didn't address this issue. Number oh. one, they didn't say anything about the airway, what they do with the airway, and they didn't give any fluids. Right. If, if anything, you're going to say, what, what's, he's been pooping black stuff. For a long time, throwing up, and throwing up black stuff. He's got to be hypovolemic. I mean, any idiot would give him fluids. One would hope. But after downtime of that long, actually, it should have been called to the base immediately. Immediately, start CPR. Hello. Yes. Yeah. But if you're going to initiate care, at least do the do the right care. Do the right care. I would have done if if. We didn't have a DNR and all that stuff yet. That's when you do that. You start CPR, I'll call, and we'll cancel it right away because it's useless. Right. This was a no-win situation. Um, My question is, did it do the wife any good to have her husband that when her statement that they printed there 
says, good, he's not in pain anymore. I mean, she knew from reading this that he was a goner. Right. Even before he went. And, that, and that's he, hard. He was a goner from December. Right. And that's hard to document, though. I mean, you, there could have been someone with the, with the wife going, you know, hey, he's not really looking good, and blah, blah, blah. If, if, obviously, that's not documented, but it sounds like she understood the situation and understood the futility of it because he was, he himself, not sought mental care. Right. So, care appropriate? No. Is it common? Yes. yes. Were they the only two there the whole time? Did they get... Evidently, that's time? what I, I gather. Um, overall impression? Should have called earlier while somebody was doing the CPR. The last MAC meeting, one of the last MAC meetings, you were talking about talking CPR and all that stuff, and you made a comment that the standard in Seattle, which has the highest survival rate of CPR out of hospital of anyone in the United States, that they do absolutely no ALS mm -hmm. until they have additional resources. Mm -hmm. Because the only thing that's going to work is high quality CPR initially until you have your pit crew. So somebody trying to start two or three IVs means that the CPR was mediocre. If that. Right. And if the paramedic's trying to start a, a number of IVs, that means the EMT is doing more than two minutes of continuous CPR, which we know no matter who you are, after two minutes your CPR is going in the toilet anyways. How many attempts did they have to Four. It was at least a, a number. It was three more. attempts. The IO, which didn't sound like all they had to do was put on a pressure bag, and then they finally got on the fourth, yeah, the fourth attempt of an IV, they got it. The three attempts of an IV before starting an IO. Correct. So what, what's the protocol state? There is none. The pit crew, the, the standard that I'm now seeing for CPR in, with the pit crew is CPR, IO immediately, forget IV. Mm -hmm. Don't even bother trying to find an IV. I, I, so I, protocol came with the part. I would have to look at that and I would look at, okay, if I can't start an IV immediately, go to CPR. Because that's a possibility, right? People do have, you know, you might have, have, you know, be able to see it an IJ or something or whatever. But you can't do an EJ. EJ. If you do an EJ, if you do an EJ and CPR, you're not going to have good high quality CPR no. and a good bag valve. Cool. Or any of the other stuff, because you're right in the flipping way of but where if everybody's. Can, if you can get an, if you can get an immediate IV, great. If not, go to an IO. Right. Um, Sticking them three times, you're wasting. You're wasting the IO resources. You're wasting time and resources. They they should have just gone to an IO, but. But it was probably in the ambulance, and somebody had to run back and get it. Right. I just don't think that. They should even attempt a resuscitation. They should have started CPR, call the base. Black fingers shows no perfusion. Mass on the pancreas, weight loss for the last four months, uh, in and out with nausea, vomiting, throwing up blood, uh, too weak to stand up. Uh, right. But, no, I, I agree with that wholeheartedly. The, the, the question is, okay, do I, we have to change the protocol now? I think there is. I got to take another. I think it says one IV attempt. No, it does not. I believe it. I believe the last thing I looked at it, it was if you cannot find an IV site, go to an IO. I'll double check that. It doesn't. It says your inability to obtain peripheral access in a patient greater than 12 years of age that requires access in emergency path. So if you can't get it, if you can't see it, go if you can't see it, if you can't get it, if you look at the patient go, <clears throat> that's not easy. I mean, if you see a rope here, then fine. But you don't see a rope, go to NIO. I think that really does say that. Yeah. So... I think that's a good wording. If you can't, if you can't do a peripheral IV, do an IO. Right. Um, so my overall impression was this was poor. Um, 
The only take home point that I can see um, is did they give the appearance to the wife that they gave him one last shot? Right. That, that's the only thing that I can see. Because they weren't going to say No, he was terminal. They, uh, so yeah. they, they didn't do any harm, even though oh, they were Right, they didn't do any harm. That, that's for sure. Because um, there's no way that they, even if you had a central line in, or they got in the I.O. immediately, and they were pouring fluids in, yeah, um, no red blood cells left anyway. He, right, he probably had a hemoglobin of three. Yeah. And... So add two liters of fluid, and now you have pale pink blood. Right. So... So 12 minutes without oxygen to his brain, and then add no red blood cells going to his brain because there aren't any. It ain't going to work anyways. Right. I would like to ask a question. No. What, Jackie? Say going to ask it anyway. Okay. We're looking at this strictly from a documentation point of view, is that correct? Mm hmm So, in this case, since you looked at it, did you ever make contact with the providers? Uh, I am going to. I only looked at this um, Sunday. So, but yes. I think sometimes there are extenuating circumstances. I'm, I'm agreeing with everything that's being said, but there may have been circumstances on scene that didn't come out in the report. Right. Right, I understand that. And I will make contact with the provider because, and, and I do routinely after I've done a run review if this is a case that I think warrants it. And this one does because I want to know what was going on. Um, you know, was this just to make the wife feel better? Okay. Um, so, you know, I can talk to the provider and if you, if you are interested, um, I can give you guys feedback next month. Thank you. I just think, you know, if there were only two of them there and like you said, trying to make the wife feel better, you know, agreed they should have contacted base. I don't have a problem with that, but. I always feel like I need to know all the facts before I make some sort of judgment. Well, yeah, um, I mean, that's the problem of doing run review and or CQI or QA is you're depending upon the documentation. And you're right, the subtleties and a lot doesn't get transmitted into the paper record or electronic record. So I'll give you guys some feedback uh, next month on this case. Thank you, Jackie. You're welcome. So, next case. Dispatch code three for a possible stroke. Arrived to find a 67-year-old male, once again sitting on the toity, feeling weak and dizzy. The toilet is a dangerous place. It is. Uh, patient states he was using the bathroom when he passed out. Um, he's very lucky he didn't hit his head on the, and, uh, so he said he woke up partially in his bathtub, which is next to the toilet. You know, that happened to my great uncle, no, my uncle, who's 80 something years old, passed out, hit the tub, got a splenic rupture. So, bathrooms are dangerous places. Just use depends and see Now I know what to get you for your birthday, Mr. Lane. Depends. Way to go. So he said he also been feeling nauseated today and has had vomited once. Denies any vomit in the blood. Has a history of diabetes and bradycardia. So his airway is clear and open. Breathing is non labor with equal rise and fall. Good. Pulse, 45. That will get your attention. It's a little slow. GCS is fine, lungs are clear and all, skin pale, warm and dry. Patient states he feels dizzy, which gets worse when standing, uh -huh. nauseated, and feels nauseated and weak when he's on his feet. Negative abdominal pain, shortness of breath, or chest pain. 
equal grip strength, negative facial droop, clear speech. Pretty good. While on scene, he's placed on some oxygen. Four liters raises the pulse oximetry from 94 to 98. Lifted to the gurney, placed in a position of comfort, transported appropriately, code two. In route, monitor shows the sinus brady, so there's a 12 lead. They establish an a IV in his left AC. They did a blood glucose check with the catheter. Phone reports on a hospital, no further orders. So far, okay. No. Arrived at destination, no further changes in condition. Uh, no, no med allergies. He's on a boatload of meds. Lantus is long acting insulin, Novawalk. It's a short acting insulin. Uh, the next one is a steroid inhaler. Uh, the next one is in a, a, a long acting uh, albuterol. He's on albuterol. He's also on atrovent or ipotropium. He's on gabapentin, which is for pain. Interestingly enough, he's on metoprolol, beta blocker, and he's got some asthma. Uh, it kind of makes me a little nervous. He's on lisinopril for blood pressure and to help protect his kidneys from his diabetes. He's an elevated cholesterol with his simvastatin, temazepam. He's a little stressed. Interestingly enough, he's on warfarin, so has he had a DVT or a PE? Or is it really a fib that just looks like normal cell? Well, we'll have an EKG that we can take a look at soon. Oh. Amylodipine, again, high blood pressure, HCTZ, vitamin B12, Spariva, which is another inhaled steroid, and hydralazine. Interesting mixture of meds. Right. So, 1429, oriented person, place, and time, event, neuro is normal, eyes are reactive, Skin, pale, warm, and dry. Head and face are normal. Lungs, pretty good. Heart, not normal. Slow rate. Um, abdominal exam is unremarkable. Uh, spinal exam is unremarkable. And his extremity exam is unremarkable. So, a little hypotensive there. That's why I questioned the TKO. With a heart rate of 45 and a blood pressure that low, this person should have been getting fluid boluses. He could have taken it 500 without even sweating it to yep. find out if it did any good. Exactly. Especially when he stands up and he gets dizzy. Can you say orthostasis? <laughs> I thought you could. Um, it also could be because he's on a beta blocker and he's overly sensitive. Uh, monitor, sinus brady, um, they get his IV on an extremity, oxygen, and here is his 12 lead. I don't see any P waves either. I'm seeing a lot. Of, <laughs> I'm seeing a lot of crap. There's an inverted one, but that doesn't count as a P wave. So you can't call it sinus without a P wave, as to the best of my knowledge. Right. I don't care what the EKG says. It says sinus bradycardia. Oh, is that what it says? No, it says abnormal. Marked sinus bradycardia. So it says. See, and unfortunately, you don't. It's too far. You got two. You don't have the the strip of the two to get a good R to R. That's all I had. I did not have a strip. There should have been a strip, but there wasn't. So. Fib at a very slow rate. Mm-hmm. That's why he's on warfarin. That's why he's on warfarin. Yeah. So he needs off his beta blocker at least. Mm -hmm. Or took too much of it. Yeah. Ooh, did I take it today or not? Oh, let me take an extra. Take an extra. Yeah, absolutely. Let's 
So, so what do you think of the documentation? Not bad. <clears throat> Quality of care. I should give them some fluids. Not probably. Okay, give them some fluids. Any other issues or concerns? Were orthostatic blood pressures done? No. Yeah. Anymore. They did not do orthostatics. Well, let's go back to 12 lead. It's not complaining of your chest pain, but my only other concern with 12 lead is, is he has an inverted. He has inverted T waves. T waves in V1, V2. So does he have anything posterior? I would do a right side DKG just because. <clears throat> but, you know, that's 10% of the population. That would still cover me, right? No, it's, it's, an, it's, it's an excellent point about doing a right-sided uh, lead on him. Um, because if you look at lead one, he's got a nice little um, depression there in the QRS. Um, and his flip T waves anteriorly make me nervous. Yeah, I mean, he's, he, he certainly meets the criteria of needing it, I think. So, I don't know if the medics would catch that, but... Anyway. How many have you done, Tom? Left side? About one. It's always food to thought. Now, if Corky was here, he'd probably do an 18 group. And I've also done more 12 leads since... Matt has now learned about 12 leads and he's really pushing me to it. That's a good thing. <laughs> so, what do you think of the care? They made Bates hospital contact, didn't they, at one point? Did I remember that? Nope. It, yeah, it said... Oh, they did? It did. They did? Let me see this. It, it said that they called and they said, just keep doing what you're doing. I, I would, yeah, so they weren't given orders for fluid boluses. Keep going. And yep, you're right. To the hospital, no further orders. And the protocol that we've written is said keep the systolic above 90. Remember, titrate to keep the BP above 90. Right. That's generally for they traumas, were, but not for. You know, can they be faulted? Maybe not. I don't know. The only thing I would say is they should have done orthostatics just to see how low he goes. See, but with beta blockers, is you're not going to get a change in heart rate because it's going to stay you know, low. You might up in blood pressure. You might. I mean, this, if, if if they were calling into you, Dr. Redmond, and you go, okay, well, in a perfect world, what would I want to do to treat the patient? Would you be concerned with the fluids, or I? My other question is, did he? How much beta blocker did he take? And do we need to address that? I would give him fluids, and... As far as I'm concerned, he's hemodynamically unstable. Exactly. And he's symptomatic. He, he is symptomatically, he's hemodynamically unstable. He needs to have his heart rate sped up, and you could try one of two ways. I'd and try the least invasive first, which is probably not going to do anything. You could atropine. ask him, it's really simple. I, all you have to do is, would you like a drug, or would you like electricity across your chest? If they say, oh, I don't want the electricity, you go with the drug first. That's the way you make a decision on whether. Right. Would, would, you, you, would you give him atropine, which you know is not going to do any good, or would you give him a drug that work, works well? That's all you have. But what, you me. pace him. Or happy. I wouldn't give him happy, but I might pace him. But I don't think he needs an, a dopamine drip at this point. Mm -mm. He needs he needs his heart rate sped up. Dopamine yes. would do that at higher levels, but no, I would. You can you sometimes get surprised with atropine, but I try the atropine, oh, I give them so. some fluids, and then I would pace them. And this was a paramedic call, correct? Correct. Okay. So were these in NorCal or were they in They're all in NorCal. Okay. Where I won't say it, but they were all in no, the You don't have to say it. You don't have to tell us they're from Trinity or wherever. I know. 
They weren't mine. Well, I think they should have gotten maybe a little more direction from Bates Hospital, too. That's uh, true, too. But you never know what the medic told the base hospital. Okay, he's now stable. Two minutes out, and the hospital, yeah. the hospital says, "Okay, keep bringing him in because there's no reason to do anything drastic within a couple of minutes out from the hospital." Right. They are. They're really busy. They don't have time to tell the paramedic what they should know or anything. Okay. Or the hospital's small. Doesn't have an MIC on it, MICN available at the time, and it's that's um, the ward clerk that's answering the radio. Who says, yeah, yeah so just keep bringing them in because it happens. I know, and I just don't want to think about it. <laughs> See, I never ask for orders when I call terminator. I usually just say, "Do you have any questions?" Okay. I usually don't even ask. So. Um, that was the last case. I only did three this month. So, any questions, comments, things for the good or the order, unquote? Okay. Well... Uh, we're finished a little early. Thank you, everybody, for participation. Um, I've got some homework to do, and I'll look forward to seeing you or hearing you um, next month. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye, guys.